This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today in Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore how naked mole rats can save humans, how horses have done more to spice up the monarchy than anyone else, and an ancient Greek playwright died at the hands of a flying turtle. Truly, let's go. My favorite part of doing this show is discovering other new shows to me that are either just offshoots of weird things that happen to people or tangentially related to animals or the intersection of other professions where humanity meets. These might not be in the top 10 of iTunes or Pandora, but but I'm pretty pumped about these new to me podcasts who have been going on for quite some time. The first you might have heard me talk about during the Cocaine Bear episode, which is Southern Oddities Podcast. I have been kind of hooked on this show. They are short, they are fun, and it's introducing me, a Northeaster, to another part of our country that I never really, unfortunately, go out of my way to explore and learn about. And it's fascinating to me, the history of the Deep South. Um, So check that podcast out if you haven't already. And I would highly recommend starting with the Cocaine Bear episode. Another one is Varmints. It's a duo with Paul and Donna who pick a single animal and do a deep dive on them. They do weird facts, how science, education, and nature intersect with these animals, all of it, and they are so kind. And if you just love the animal part of Bewilderbeast and not all the little sidetracks I take, this might be the show for you. Or if you're doing a book report on the II, totally check them out. Another is Just the Zoo of Us. It's a really informative, quirky, quite funny little podcast about animals as they discuss and then in a very modern twist, rate and review two animals every episode. My daughter Ace really loves Wow in the World, which is perfect for young people who crave science, all kinds of science. And if you enjoyed the Great Larvations episode, remember the giant snot house of the sea cleaning up our plastic from way back when? Well, that was inspired by this show, produced and created by Guy Raz and Mindy Thomas. For littles, this is perfect. Earth Rangers is a similar niche. All things animal and interesting, animal facts, and while the seasons are short, as are the episodes, they really do tap into a kid's curiosity. The episodes are very well produced and perfect for a younger audience. And lastly is Planthropology. Vikram Baliga talks not just about plants, but about people who work with plants. Y'all, you might think that's boring unless you're already a budding horticulturalist, but not at all if you have ever drank tea or coffee or have ever thought about how soil changes after you bury someone. All of that matters. And all of that is plants. So as I'm in the lull between my morning brew and my evening brew, I'm going to just put that out there as plants aren't boring. They intersect at humanity in many of the same ways that animals do. So if that's your cup of tea or whatever, give plant anthropology a listen. Otherwise, we're just chilling out here in the pandemic. I'll announce the winners in the next episode of the iTunes review rate random drawing thing. And if you miss the opportunity this time, that is okay. You can still leave a review right now, and that will put you in for the next drawing. So go and do that. There is a reason that we all ask for this, and it's because it truly is the best way to get this show in front of other people to hear and hopefully enjoy. We have so many interesting twists and turns in Kings Lewis's, the plural, who had died by hubris and horses. Horrible combination. So without further ado, 
Happy spring. And let's get on with the podcast. So we all know we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, or CO2. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. It's a nice symbiotic relationship. We love trees, trees love us, and we really should take more care of these trees. But there's someone else we need to look at for our expunged carbon dioxide, the naked mole rat. Now, if you've never seen a naked mole rat, also called a sand puppy, but... Truthfully, as a dog trainer, if I saw a puppy who looked like a naked mole rat, I would advise that it gets checked out immediately by a veterinarian. They have some very interesting features. I mean, there's the one that's already in their name. They're essentially naked with some tufts of old man ear hair like strings coming off of their bodies, but they are also essentially a mammal that is cold blooded. They require, unlike most mammals, other sources to stay warm, which Unlike snakes who can find a heat rock in the sun, naked mole rats are underground, so they need just warm bodies. So, they sleep in piles. They seek out each other for warmth and companionship, and that produces a lot of exhaling. Which is CO2. But we're going to come back to that in a minute. However, the group sleeping situation tends to be one feature of the naked mole rat that I really like. They are one of only two eusocial mammals. Wait, what's eusocial? Eusocial, E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L, is what we think of when we think of animals like bees and ants and other social insects. The entire colony, hive, group, they all work together for the good of the hive, always. They help raise the babies, feed everyone, and they are the highest level of social organization. Which, as the only other mammal to have a breeding female select males for making babies and everyone else working collectively for the good of everyone, is not human. It's the Damara land mole rat. Given that they live in a harsh and unforgiving environment, they live underground in a handful of African countries. It's dark so dark that their eyes do little for the naked mole rat, and even if they had light, they cannot see very well at all. They have these giant buck teeth that dig under the dirt, and they can go up to five kilometers. In fact, their digging teeth and jaws are so critical to the naked mole rat that one out of every four muscles in their entire body are dedicated to closing their jaws while they dig. Hey, Frankie, you've been working out? Yeah, man, every day is jaw-lifting day. Ugh. They can also move just as fast backwards as they can forwards, which you should try this. I promise we are not built for this kind of activity. Naked mole rats are also resistant to cancer, which, woohoo, might be a key to their lifelong longevity. They can live up to 32 years. This is the longest lifespan of any rodent. The skin of the naked mole rat lacks neurotransmitters, which means they don't feel pain if they are exposed to certain things, and in this case, acids are capsaicin. Researchers, being all researchery, injected naked mole rats with substance P. This is not a rap name. This is a substance that communicates signals from the body to the brain about things like chronic pain. So if you know somebody with arthritis, this might be useful to them. Substance P was injected into the back leg of several mole rats, and while under normal conditions they do feel things like pinching or pushing in pressure, mole rats did not feel the heat from the capsaicin, the chemical that makes chilies really freaking hot. And your mouth burn, or if you've had an unpleasant experience of cutting jalapenos and then rub your eyeball because there was an ill-timed eyelash situation, burns a lot. I'm just saying don't do that. But they might also be able to help us with chronic pain conditions like arthritis, which affects many mammals like cats and dogs and humans. And these are just some of the animals who suffer from this painful condition. So this is proposed to be an adaptation of the animals living in high levels of carbon dioxide due to poorly ventilated living spaces, which would cause acid to build up in their body tissues, which is why they might not be able to feel it now. And this leads me to the point of today's piece and bringing it back to the carbon dioxide thing. Remember, the plant bit from the top? 
Because these naked mole rats live underground, and they've adapted to live with higher concentrations of carbon dioxide from all that snuggling and failed social distancing that they do, imagine sitting under a blanket. Your face is all warm and cozy, but at some point you have to breathe air. The mole rats essentially live their entire existence under that blanket, with hundreds of other naked mole rats breathing. Very little oxygen can get in, though they do need it to breathe. They will die without oxygen, but they just need less of it than we do. And what's fascinating is that they don't seek out higher concentrations of oxygen. No, the opposite. They seek out pockets of carbon dioxide underground. In fact, if these mole rats don't have enough carbon dioxide, the stuff we cannot have in large quantities, they will have seizures. So the naked mole rat has evolved to need higher levels of CO2. And without it, their brain electricity goes, well, haywire. And they have seizures. And what's so fascinating is that some humans have similar mutations that lead to some kinds of seizures and epilepsy in people, as well as autism and schizophrenia. And by studying the naked mole rat and figuring out how these mechanisms work, we might learn a little bit about how to help people particularly those with seizure disorders and epilepsy. So let's take the 2 to 4% of children under the age of 5 years old who suffer from seizures after just running a high fever. This is called febrile seizure, and in a 2014 study published by the journal EMBO Reports, it suggested that some of these children share the same genetic quirk that the naked mole rats have. It's the exact same thing that makes them prone to seizures without carbon dioxide. Plant juice, our exhale, you under the blanket. Which might be a clue that while genetics are crucial in conditions like seizures, air quality and breathing patterns might also play an important role in human epilepsy. Why does this matter? Well, according to the World Health Organization... 80% of people living in cities like urban environments are breathing in unhealthy air, which can lead to conditions like asthma, chronic conditions, and yep, epilepsy. And guess who is affected more by this? Certain racial demographics like Hispanic and Black people in addition to poor people, lower socioeconomic classes, and those in lower educational brackets. Essentially, non-white populations and mostly Black populations can't even have air equality. And while I live in a city and one that I feel is fairly progressive, it's important to stress that when people are asking for equality or equity, it's not just voting rights or taking down signs that have segregated water fountains. It's more than that. It's the very air we breathe and it's every aspect of humanity. It's all affected by inequality and once you see it, you cannot unsee it. The housing projects nearest to me are all right next to the highway overpass, and the air quality there is considerably less good than in any other part of our city. Now back to the naked mole rats and their role in our health. None of this is to suggest that people with seizures move underground or deprive themselves of oxygen, and if you end up reading that on Goop or some other corner on the internet, back slowly away and take a deep breath. Researchers are looking into these brain functions to see what can be done to help, and that is pretty cool. Thanks, Naked Mole Rat. And if you're a little kid who likes to read, Mo Willems wrote one of my favorite kids' books of all time, The Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed. Check your local library and enjoy. It is the cutest little story, and it has stuck with me years after my little became a not-so-little anymore. A few weeks ago, we covered several ways in which leaders died in unfortunate ways, leading to the conversation about King Alexander of Greece, who died by a monkey bite. But it turns out, there are several horses who decided to shake things up in the monarchies. For starters, King Louis III, while mounting his horse to pursue a girl who was running to seek refuge in her father's house, no means no, y'all, he ended up hitting his head on the low door frame, and he fell, fracturing his skull. And he died. King Louis IV, 
who had been in battle and was captured for a year. But he didn't die in battle. He didn't die after actually being captured and imprisoned for a year, but he fell off his horse while chasing a wolf. Y'all, don't do that. He died. His grandson, King Louis V. I don't know how the numbers work here or why they only had two names, I guess, in old-timey times. Fifth time's a charm, right? Well, I'm guessing you can guess the basic strokes. Yep, he also fell off a horse while hunting in the forest. And he died. King Louis VI? Hey, buddy, want to go for a horse ride? Yeah, no, I'll pass. <laughs> Which leads me to King William of Orange. And the Brits referred to this as the Glorious Invasion. But I guess if you ask the Scottish or even some of the Irish, they might not think it in quite the same way. In cases like this, it really goes to show that a PR degree can be very useful. Now, I have to read this verbatim from the London Remembers website because it made me choke on the water I was sipping on at the time. William was formally invited by seven senior political men to invade Britain in order to replace the unpopular King James II. Formally invited. Now, was this a black tie invasion? Did he have a date and a corsage? And my God, what kind of tie goes well with a palace coup? It turns out it's a bit more serious than that. You see, James II, total jerk. And when he got the opportunity to lead England, he decided he would just, you know, lead by himself. Tyrant gonna tyrant. He didn't think he needed parliament or the people. Basically, he wanted to be a dictator and he was growing bolder and bolder. And he wanted to put England under Catholic rule, which in the 1600s, I'm sure was a super great time for LGBTQ, women, black people, poor people. But the immortal seven, the seven men who owned land, who didn't think that this would go well for them personally, because no more parties, no more after hours socializing with, you know, non-spousal companions, really no more fun and no more power. So these seven men planned to overthrow the government and they wrote to the Dutch guy, William of Orange, and even wrote their invitation in code some super cool spy stuff. Now, this letter basically said, hey, Billy, sup? How's your mom? How's your wife? Hey, isn't she the daughter of our current king? I mean, we're just spitballing here, really. If if your wife Mary was up to it and y'all wanted just to come south to live, you know, just come to England and take our throne. Because, like, if you invade and stuff, we'll back you. We have no ulterior motive at all. We just really like you a lot. We totes got your back. But psst, we will have a list of demands that we will give you. But it's all just normal paperwork. You get it, right? Cool, cool. See you in a few weeks. Have a safe voyage. Y'all, this worked. William of Orange took an army to England after being invited to invade England from the English. James II ran away, I imagine peeing his pantaloons and whimpering. These seven elites backed him and everything was totally cool. And by backed, the seven elite guys provided a list of demands to basically lessen the king's position and give more power to the land-owning parliament. These seven guys demanded that the army is now under control of parliament, not the king or queen, and that the monarchy is not solely in charge of England. That power went to parliament, which seemed great. Parliament is an elected body very much like America's House and Senate, elected representation which did not exist until here, which became England's Bill of Rights, and they call this the Glorious Revolution, though it was really more of a shift in power, as revolutions are usually the people getting upset, and they uprise, and they change things, which did not happen in this case. I would argue seven powerful rich guy sending an invite to another king to say, hey, take our throne, it's a gift, doesn't quite count. Giving the power to seven rich white dudes playing a game where they could put whatever pliable guy in charge who would shape the future elections for 150 years by rigging these elections for only landowners. And basically, they could just go through the motions of an election while making sure people's voices weren't ever actually heard because they weren't rich, white, landowners, run in the same circles, 
Basically, votes only matter if you're white, rich, or powerful, or know the right people. That's not good for the people. But what does this have to do with animals or horses? Well, William of Orange also died from a fall from a horse. (laughs) But this one was what I expected. William of Orange, essentially an immigrant who dethroned a tyrant, and due to that event, England developed a Bill of Rights. Woohoo! And he endowed the William and Mary College, the second oldest college in the United States, the second one after Harvard. William did not die in battle. He did not die overtaking England, which is where I really thought this was going to turn to a wear your helmet always cautionary tale. No, his horse was jauntily horseying in a field when his horse tripped over a mole's burrow. Those spindly little horse legs will get you every time. (laughs) And that threw William of Orange. He broke his collarbone and died days later from a pneumonia infection related to the we don't have antibiotics or have any ways to fix you of the 1700s. In an unusual twist of possible foreshadowing, there was a statue erected that was installed in College Green, Dublin, Ireland, with William mounted proudly on his horse. One year before, he would be killed by the results of falling from that horse. There's one more animal here, and whereas moles are usually caused for people to start Googling mole trap, there's a different situation going on at Cooladen. So there are these guides called the Jacobites, and they were the group who did not like that the William of Orange had taken over England. They were supporters of the last king, the one who had to run away peeing his pantaloons. So the Jacobites, they didn't like him very much, and while the moles were getting pretty close to where men fell in battle fighting against William of Orange's rule... And they were buried where they fell at Cooladen. These Jacobites were actually pretty cool with all this. And they said that they would not advocate for the removal of their little heroes, the little moles that took out the king that they didn't like. I mean, unless human bones just started showing up above ground. So it goes to show that history is complicated and perspective matters. Eagles love turtle meat, but turtles have a famously dense protective shell. But there is one way to get to the gooey bits of a turtle if you're an eagle. You have to get through the shell, and eagles have a great way to do this. So they pick up their slow-moving prey, fly up higher and higher still, and use their eagle eyes to spy the perfect rock. And as turtles are not great flyers, the eagles drop the turtle, A turtle probably thinking, wow, look at this view. Yeah, my mom was right. I really can do anything that I set my mind to, shortly before crashing onto a rock for a quick death and an eagle eats well. So tuck that info away for a minute. In 456 BC, the Greeks loved to philosophize, write, and be Greek. One such author, Aeschylus, the father of tragedy, you know, the two drama masks, comedy and tragedy. One happy mask, one sad mask, and they represent drama, theater, and is often the first tattoo of many theater kids the minute they turn 18. Yeah, the father of tragedy, the sad guy mask, was spending either as much time as he could outside or as little, depending on the perspective. I'm going with outside as much. You see, Daddy Tragedy was in a cult called the Illusnian Mysteries, and those mysteries are so mysterious we still don't know much about it today. We do know that they are the most famous of the secret religious rites of ancient Greece. However, members of this cult thought that Aeschylus was slipping in rites and rituals and practices and secrets into his writing, his plays, his stories, and this kind of carried a death penalty. And the Greeks did not mess around. It's said that Aeschylus then heard a prophecy suggesting that he would die by falling object. So he was spending more time outside to avoid falling vases falling murderous cult assassins. You know, stuff like that. Though this is unlikely true, much like prophecies in general. An eagle around the same time as Aeschylus was wandering around Sicily found a turtle and started to fly upwards. Aeschylus, famously bald, was outside getting some vitamin D, trying, you know, not to die. Basics. The eagle kept flying higher and higher. Aeschylus must have thought, and I'm translating this from the ancient Greek, yeah, I totes got this. Ha ha! What's going to hit me out here in the open air? We haven't invented airplanes yet, so I think I'm good. 
The eagle dropped the turtle on a particularly shiny, fleshy, strolling rock. Aeschylus stopped, looked up at the sun, saw a weird shadow that looked suspiciously like a falling turtle from the sky. Huh, I didn't know turtles could fly. They can't. Turtles can gravity. The turtle did not strike. A nice shiny rock as the eagle intended. The turtle did land smack on Aeschylus's head, which killed him immediately. But hey, the turtle lived. And if you want to read a fun fantasy book that incorporates this story, check out Small Gods by Terry Pratchett. The turtle moves. And if you like trilogies of any sort, you can thank your boy Aeschylus. He's the guy who's thought to be the first to produce writing and plays in three-story arcs which I'm personally a fan of. Have you ever heard of the OG Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, other wonderful trilogies and books and movies? I'm personally a fan of Zeta the Space Girl. It's a great graphic novel for kids ages 3 to 10 and for the adults reading along. So thanks, Aeschylus. Thank you very much. So thank you today for joining me on Bewilderbeasts. If you like this podcast, please share and tell all your friends. It's truly the best way to support this show. If there are topics that you are interested in, if you know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, horses who murdered more kings, or falling turtles from the sky who changed the course of history, there are multiple ways to send those topics in or let me know what you think of the show. Visit the website, Bewilderbeast Pod. There you can find episodes to start with, share episodes about the show, learn how to support the show, and see bonus art for some of the podcast episodes. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod. You can DM or voice text at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. I want to make sure that this is an accessible medium for everyone, so feel free to voice text instead if that's easier for you or your littles to share facts. The voice text feature allows a person to leave a one-minute voice message on their favorite animal fact or resource for the show. You can always just lurk at bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog, creator of Mud Stuff Media, and this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from lung.org, the World Health Organization on air pollution levels rising in many of the world's poorest cities, livescience.com, smithsonianmag.com, technologynetworks.com on the neuroscience of the naked mole rat, and a great live science YouTube video that I will have linked and put up on social on how these mole rats and their seeking out carbon dioxide can help humans with seizures. LondonRemembers.com on King William of Orange. YouTube.com, Timelines.tv, History of Britain B10. YouTube.com, the Exploring History channel on England's Glorious Revolution Explained. I, I can't hype this one enough. This really helped me understand what was going on politically. Wikipedia.org on William III of England. Wikipedia on the Glorious Revolution. London Remembers on the King William III of Orange goldencharter.co.uk on six strange deaths from history, cracked.com on the five historical figures who died the weirdest deaths, and allthatsinteresting.com, embarrassing celebrity deaths. Links are always in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, share with your curious friends, you know, all the things that every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Next week.